America. My name is Iremi Osei Frimpong. I come to you live every Thursday about this time. And today I'm going to talk to you about moral panic. So a moral panic is kind of a cultural conflagration. A conflagration is not just a fire. Even a lot, a lot of words today. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling words today. A conflagration is not just a fire. It's a particular kind of fire. It's a fire that is out of control. So the idea with a moral panic is that not only is this policy bad, it's bad in a way that's out of control, that the regular processes won't handle it or aren't up to it, right? So if I say I'm going to start a campfire outside and use all you can think about is like a the house burning on fire and the whole neighborhood burning on fire and the whole world burning on fire. You are panicking over something that you shouldn't panic over, right? So that is uh, the origin of moral panic. So we can talk about sex panics, about how some people say, like, you know, if you dance too much, uh, 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 you'll, you'll, you'll lead to um, uh, kind of a, a sexual awakening that'll be out of control. And so we should ban dancing. There was uh, the Red Scare, the communist panic that like, if you think that maybe we should have socialized medicine that you're really just aiming for a, a takeover of all civil liberties. Um, uh, or, you know, there's Red Panic, there's, uh, you know, various sexual panics. Um, about how playing video games will lead you to shoot up schools or, you know, music panics um, around how, you know, certain songs will lead you to commit domestic violence. Um, so there's this whole genre of panics around. Uh, and the GOP is famously very good at setting up moral panics, right? So the conservatives always will tell you everything that might be progress is actually something that's going to tear away the fabric of the nation as we know it. And that's what you do when you don't really know the nation <laughs> and you don't know what hangs it together, what why it hangs together, and you don't know why it's good. So you just think that any change could just destabilize the whole thing because you don't know why it, it's all held together anyway. You don't have any intrinsic sense of what makes it what it is. So you you think that any sort of like destabilization or change is actually a fundamental qualitative change that'll make it really different than what it is. And so there are a few things we have to understand. Progressive policies will change the status quo. In a well-ordered world, you know, if I come to power, what you think of as a lot of what you think about gender, a lot of what you think about race, and a lot of what you think about labor is going to have to go the way of the dodo bird. Um, a lot of what you think about the family, uh, but I'm a fan of family. Like you don't have to get rid of families. You don't have to get rid of gender. You don't have to get rid of uh, race necessarily, but it's not going to look like what you think it's going to look like. In my world, black people have assets. <laughs> they have assets, stable relationships, and, um, and possibly women get drafted to go to war. I know, I know. But I, I looked in the, uh, I looked in the, looked it up, and it turns out black women are way disproportionately representative in the U.S. military. Anyway, so we don't have to change much. Everybody else is going to th think about it, think about it as an attack of their way of life. Um, but not us. We'll be fine. We'll be actually more whole. So a moral panic is kind of a cultural worry that this thing, whatever the thing might be, you know, gay marriage, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the idea of a union, uh, a workers union, I guess a lot of these moral panics revolve around the idea of like un uncomfortable unities, <laughs> black men walking around free, all of these things you think can't just stop where they're supposed to stop. They're going to actually infect all of society and bring down society as you know it. Right? So if you think that that's the way the world works, you're going to have, that's that you are in the throes of a panic. And the only way to get you out of that panic isn't to say that actually things won't change. This is, this is something that, that people get wrong. 
They say that like no, the way you convince people that there's not a panic, is, uh, not to panic, is that tell them that things won't really change. That's not true. Things would and should change, but they're not going to get worse. The reason you think they're going to get worse is because you don't really know why they're good to begin with and you don't know what keeps it all together, right? So you teach critical race theory in, so the GOP says they're trying to teach critical race theory in, in junior high and the regular company Democrats say like, no, we don't. It's just something that taught in graduate school. We don't teach junior high school um, uh, students the truth about race in America. And what they should say and what the left does, well, what some of the left does and what they should say is actually, yes, we are trying to educate the whites about themselves because we've had a distorted notion about the workings of race in America for the last few hundred years. And, you know, we dealt with this a generation ago with the lost cause when people who thought that, you know, the South was about slave <laughs> states rights and not states rights to own black people. Um, and we had to debunk their history, and we have some other things that we can talk about in terms of the truth about who we are and about how power moves and money moves in this nation to help us be more democratic citizens. That's not going to destroy the nation. Um, and you don't want, and that's what you want out of, you know, an education, right? So, yes, things are going to change. Little Johnny's going to learn something in a way that you didn't. But little Johnny's also going to learn the America that you should have. Right, so you don't need to panic. So Democrats will tell you, don't panic. We're not doing anything wrong. I'm telling you, actually things are gonna change, but it'll be okay. <laughs> it'll be easy when, when, when black people are made whole. Your life is not gonna be worse. It might be a little bit different because a lot of your life is based on our degradation and that's gonna end, right? So telling people that their education, their family, how they think of property, all they think of themselves isn't going to change, isn't the truth. You tell them that it is going to change, but it's not going to be um, worse. And for that, you need to actually inculcate a, sense of, a democratic sensibility. You have to say that what we're doing is making the situation whole, and you have to care more about democracy than you care about your little grift, your little white supremacist grift. You have to care more about democracy than that. And these are the institutions we're, we're building. We're building democratic institutions. Your community, you're not going to lose your community. Your community is just going to have to change a little bit. And insofar as you, you have to change your way of life, it's just going to be the aspects of your way of life that depend on black degradation. <laughs> and so that might be a change in your way of life. But, like, not the worst. And so people think of panics as just like a GOP thing. They manufacture panics anytime they run out of issues to talk about. But actually, there are liberal panics, too. And I'm going to talk about those after I hit the opening, if I can find it. Where's my opening? I cannot find my opening. I guess I will just go right to it. Oh, here it is. To the beach, y'all. Uh, yeah. Sound good to me. Never change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state facts. You leave it up to me, I paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. To the beat, To the beat, y'all. Ah, yeah. Sound good to me. All right, and I am back. So we we're talking about panics when just a cultural idea gets the, people get the notion that this little cultural improvement might actually lead to the end of society as we know it. <laughs> and it's not going to it's not going to end, um, lead to the end of society as we know it. By the way, I did a wonderful interview with Pamela Denise Long. Denise Long, she is lovely. She's wonderful. And we had a great talk. She's a black Republican. And I am not a Republican, but she is. But she's one of the good ones, let me tell you. And let me tell you, if the Republican Party looked more like her and sounded more like her, I might be one because I'm not particularly in love with the Democrats. So, and I, I actually don't like the Democrats at all, I'll be honest. But uh, I think it's, it might be easier to change the Democrats than it is to declan the GOP. But that's contingent. It might not be. It might be easier to declan the GOP than it is to actually change the Democrats because the Democrats are attached and invested invested in the status quo in a way, including the status quo of black degradation. Um, 
in a way that they don't admit. And I'll tell you, you know, I thought of a pretty good analogy last night. I was like, you know, we have a, America has a, has a curable disease in terms of anti-black racism. It's a curable disease. Rep, uh, reparations are, it's curable. It's easier than giving guns to, uh, um, to, to the Ukrainians. It's actually sanctioning all of Russia and, and it's actually a curable disease. But we have a democratic party that wants to give us pain killers. We broke our leg, right? Um, inflicted by the United States. The United States broke our leg and the Democrats want to give us painkillers and that's not going to fix our broken leg. And the Republicans want to give a, like want to do like an invasive surgery with jagged, rusting, fetid tools in order to, uh, in order to help us. And I don't want that either. I just want them to set the bone straight. Set it right. Set, set it right. And, um, and we'll be whole, right? So that was my goal. And I think that's the right way to think about it. And I think that's the right way to think about it. We just need our governments to set it right. Um, yeah, the, someone said the Democrats started the Klan, not the Republicans. That's true, but there was a move. My mom started out in South Carolina, but then she moved to California. Now I'm California. The Democrats started off the Klan, but then they moved to the GOP. People can move, and sometimes they move in mass. It was a great migration. <laughs> it was a great migration. Black people moved from the South to the West and the North and the Midwest, and the Klan moved from the Democrats to the uh, Republicans. But it doesn't matter because, you know, you got Republicans who are Klan and Democrats who are confused about why they can't be friends. <laughs> um, and, you know be closer friends with the Klan than they can with the black people. So, um, that's where we are. That's, that's, that's where we are. Uh, so let's talk about democratic sides of the moral panic. Cause I didn't put this together until I was kind of like scribbling down notes for the show. And there are a lot of democratic moral panics that are really unbecoming, right? So all of Trump, both the, beginning of Trump and all through the Trump presidency, all the resistance. So anytime you see a Democrat with a pussy hat on, she's one who's a moral panicker. <laughs> be, be very careful. The, the, the resistance style Democrats, the indivisible style Democrats are just forming on moral panic because they were trying to tell you that electing Trump is going to end the world as you know it. No, man. No. Trump has a different political vision. And I think black people knew this on some level that they knew that Trump is racist and Trump is who he is, but he isn't any worse than some of these other people, right? He's just a little bit more gauche about it. But it's not like the world is going to end when Trump was president. I was one of the few Negroes who said out loud, I think Trump might win this. And like, and when he won it, I wasn't all that mad. I mean, I wasn't a huge fan of Hillary Clinton either. And, um, I liked that Trump stood up to media. And so I thought that might open up free space, uh, free speech in a way that was, that was productive. So I see good things and bad. I saw good things and bad things about Trump winning or good things and bad things about Trump losing in 2016. And so I wasn't that mad. Honestly, if he wins in 2024, I'll be, I'll have the same attitude. It might be good to have Trump coming in 2024. I don't know. Joe Biden needs to show me something. Not that I think Trump is great, but like, I'm not, I don't think Joe Biden's going to make us whole. Black people, Joe Biden will not make us whole. At least Trump might actually uh, like introduce the idea that we're a nation. And then as a nation, we solve our national problems, which might be the black problem. You know, funny thing about Republicans is that it's not that much harder to get them to talk about reparations than it is to get Democrats to talk about reparations. But Republicans get it. Now they're going to try to lowball you. <laughs> but like they will give black descendants something like you could, I think you can get reparations through a Republican administration, not in the form that we like it, but you open it up. And when you get Democrats, um, uh, playing chicken on reparations, that means they'll talk about wanting to do it, but don't really want to do it. And you get Republicans playing chicken on reparations, talking about wanting to do it, but don't really do it. And culture supports reparations. All right. So, um, so you get Democrats and Republicans, both talking about reparations but not wanting to do it. One of them might slip up <laughs> and open the door for actual reparations. 
and that would and I want to see Black America made whole. Now I made a comment. I'll go. I'll get back to the mall um, panic bit in a second because you know I, I did make a comment on Twitter about how I want my great grandkids. I wouldn't mind. I'd like very much my great grandkids uh, to be black. And the best way for my great grandkids to be black is for black people to be made whole. And I say this because I've always said one reason that I'm for reparations is that I want the prom date of my daughter in 10 years to come from parents who both have good jobs and like stable assets. I would like that for my daughter. And I want that person to be black too, right? So I want my daughter to um, have a black prom date uh, who comes from parents with good jobs and stable assets. And for that to happen, that, that the likelihood of that happening grows exponentially if we get reparations. Because as it stands, that's, that's like not... Either the prom date will have parents with two good jobs and assets and they won't be black, or they'll be black but they won't have parents with two, with two good jobs and assets, right? So I want, I want, and so like, I want that not only for my daughter, I want that for my grandkids. And for that to happen with my grandkids, I can't control who they date, right? So like, I want the, but I do want the person they date to be like, you know, stable. So if I want that person to be black, we need reparations. And people, and then, so when I talk like that, people are like, well, if you were serious about that, you would have married a, a black woman. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't know about that because I also want to raise my kids. And I come from divorced people. Everyone, everyone in my family is divorced. Everyone, everyone, there's one cousin I have, one lonely little cousin who's like me, who kind of eloped uh, <laughs> to a white woman. Uh, he eloped and uh, he's, he's still with her and they're raising their kids. But everyone else in my family is divorced. All uncles, aunts, cousins, siblings, divorced, divorced, divorced. And I knew I did not want, not, I didn't want, did not want that to happen to me. So I did that with that. I chose like a spouse with that in mind. And that doesn't mean, um, and so like, I see a lot of divorce happening in the black community because people are kind of confused about what marriage kind of is and what holds it together. And they think that they're not confused about that. But America sells you this message that isn't really good for anybody. But when black people get that message, it just ends in divorce, right? You get this message about what marriage is and what it isn't. And that's like, it's, it's just not something that can be upheld in a black community. So, um, so any, I knew anybody who was going to marry me had to be very clear that I'm not going to be particularly financially stable. Uh, I'm not going to like, not, not going to happen. I'll have other virtues, but if you want like economic stability and all of that stuff and stay out of trouble, no, I'm going to be mouthy. And from time to time, I'm going to get fired. Um, and I knew that from, and I, you know, that's the life I lived. And I'm not going to stop doing that. By the way, if you don't, if you do support my quality of life, go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in five, fifteen, or fifty dollars a month. And so I, uh, and and I'll keep doing what I'm doing. So I knew that year, decades ago. And so when I'm thinking about marrying someone, I needed I needed someone who was going to be cool with that. <laughs> I needed someone who's going not just say they were going to be cool with that, and then once the reality of that hit, they would freak out. But someone who's cool with that. And, you know, honestly, it's not that it's not that non-black people are more confused about what that means. It's just that if you're an attractive non-black person and you're dating a black guy, you're not doing it for financial stability. And if you are, you're just stupid. Right? So um, if if you want financial stability and you're black, you might think to date a black guy uh, because that's you're, you're conventional like that. But if you want st uh, financial stability and you're not black, there is no way you're dating a black guy. That was the, like, that's like you had chance. And if you're attractive, you had chance, you had a chance with financial stability and you decided that was boring. So you're looking for something else, right? So it's not just, um, I needed someone who was going to honestly be committed to the something else, that depending on who you talk to, I bring to the table. And not just think that they're committed to the something else and then get decided, then, then kind of get frustrated that I really am something else. 
and then say to themselves, this Negro is something else. And so instead of, uh, I didn't want that Erica Badu song to be calling Tyrone. And so I wanted to save Tyrone a trip. <laughs> I saved Tyrone a trip. And, uh, you know, I, I, and that was all going through my mind. And now I have like a family with three kids. My kids are 10 minutes about to come home from school. I get to play with them, unlike my dad got to play with me. Um, I get to do, you know, music lessons and go to the soccer practices, unlike, you know, a lot of divorced parents. So I get to actually, I get to actually uh, raise my kids, which is very important to me. And, uh, and be with my family and, you know, I'm stable, everything. And, and um, yeah, so I was very intentional about, like, what I thought, what goes into a marriage. And, and you know, a lot of black, like, America is not set up for black love. It's not. But I want it to be. And that's why I want reparations, because I want my kids to have a quality of community that I lacked. <laughs> um, and that would include financially stable, like, you know, black people, like in masses, in masses. Because my kids are going to be smart. My, my kids are going to be smart and competent. And I, they're going to have options. And, I, and if I, if, so my best chance of black grandkids and great grandkids is for reparations so that they'll, that, so that like, the market will be up to my kids' level or my grandkids' level so that they'll, you know, be able to have, have people with stable jobs, like, in their family, right? So, I don't know. We all strategize around not getting divorced the right way, but, uh, you know, this all came into my mind because one of my friends, turns out he got a divorce. You know, they were like a, you know, HBCU power couple. Um... Thought they were, you know, just kind of assumed that they were going to be the next Obamas, and you know, something goes left, and and they divorced. And I didn't, I did, I knew many years ago that that was not going to be me. And so, like when I see it happening to my people, I'm like, ooh, they're by, by the grace of God, because like when that happens, I don't get to see my kids, and that's very important to me. So yes, that's how I feel about that. If we want to fix black love, we want to fix black relationships, it'll come through reparations. Um, cause you know, that means we need to break black people whole struggle. Black love shouldn't be struggle love. Um, that's not, we're not meant we're like, that's just not, that's just not, that's not stable. Right. And it, and with the different ideologies and, and, um, conventional moralities, if everyone gets the same idea about what marriage is and it's distorted, it will disproportionately affect you know, people America hates, which is us, or targets for extension. All right, so back to panic, moral panics, and the democratic side of, of moral panics. The democratic side of moral panics is, you kind of saw that when they kind of, when Bernie started winning um, primaries, and the people in mainstream media didn't quite know what to do. Because deep down, they're actually attached to a status quo, which includes like kind of a status quo of, of, of kind of oligarchy and kind of a racialized oligarchy. They're kind of used to it. And even the black people are kind of used to it because they find the little grift within it. Um, jo the joy and reads and all of that stuff. So they were freaking out. And that was a kind of panic because their way of life, they thought would fundamentally end if, if if Bernie was um, elected. Same with like the people who say like, well, you can't legitimize Fox by going on Fox, so Democratic politicians shouldn't go on Fox. That's a moral panic. Like, you don't believe in democracy if you don't if you think that going on Fox, you know, some of the highest rated news shows in the nation is going to end the nation or somehow degrade the party. No, they're talking to people. Democratic politicians going on Fox are talking to people, and I support that. Like, you are. It's a form of moral panic to say that going on Fox is somehow going to bring down the nation. Don't legitimize Trump, even after he was legitimately elected the president. Russiagate, moral panic. Like, you, like, the idea that anything that Trump do was go, did was going to fundamentally degrade the nation in a way that we cannot come back 
was never actually evidenced in anything uh, Trump did. So, um, I don't, I, the Demo so moral panics aren't just a GOP thing. They are liberal moral panics because they're also invested in the status quo, in the status quo. Uh, it's just not as obvious. So how do you diffuse, how do you diffuse moral panic? Well, you don't do it by telling people that their life isn't going to change. You don't lie. Right now, Democrats say like, well, you know, you can learn a critical race. Th we, uh, we don't teach critical race theory, and that's fine. That's lying. We should teach critical race theory. You do it by actually saying that democratic institutions are more important than whatever you're trying to hold on to. And what we're trying to do is actually strengthen our democratic institutions. We are bigger than your fear. Your fear comes from the smallest part of you. Our institutions are bigger than your fear. And you need to kind of bet on democracy and bet on building democratic institutions more than your fear of like what happens if Trump happens to be elected. If Trump happens to be elected, Trump's elected. That just means we got cultural work to do on maybe Trump or other people, right? It means Democrats have four years to get their game back better, right? So it's not going to be the end of the world. Anyone who's telling you that any of these elections are going to be the end of the world, that's just a form of moral panic. And you don't get, you don't diffuse the moral panic by saying things aren't going to change. You diffuse it by saying things might change, but not, but it's better for democracy for us to go through this change. And then you got to start like cultivating a love for democracy. Right? So you have to understand what that's about. And yeah, you diffuse moral panics by holding up democratic communities. They're not gonna, your community is not going to dissipate. It'll change form and actually be better. It will change though. If you think you can have reparations in these United States, but the white family, the white church, and the white understanding of property all stays the same, like that's it, you're lying to people. No, they're gonna change, it's gonna change, but it's okay. It's okay. There's peace on the other side too. And better. Less antagonism. Right? So you diffuse moral panic by legitimizing the fact of change, but also upholding how the change will be better. And you don't do it by just telling people that like nothing's going to change. Nothing. Yeah, it, things are going to change. You don't do it by lying to people. You do it by doubling down on democracy. That's it. How do you beat moral panics? You do it by doubling down on democracy and the character of democracy. Right? Because moral panic people, they don't think democratic institutions are, gonna, are good enough for the job. So the people who are like in favor of moral panic, they're going to start being authoritarian. Knee-jerk authoritarian. Democrats or Republicans. Like once a moral panic sets in, it's because they don't believe in democratic institutions. And so you do it, you diffuse it by doubling down on democratic institutions. And not by denying the change, but denying the strength of democratic institutions and strengthening democratic institutions. All right? All right. Thank you for your time. And I will see you next week when I talk about something completely different. I want to do something on emotions and risk. So I, I'm, I'm putting together some work on emotions and risk. By the way, if you appreciate what I'm doing, um, go ahead and give $515 or $50 to www.funkyacademic.com. And I would be grateful because it'll keep me doing what I'm doing and, and in a good stead. And understand these moral panics will always be with us. As long as there's a conservative party, there's something that they, they have a vested interest in getting you scared that there's something that won't be conserved, <laughs> right? So as long as they're children, there are going to be politicians who say, think of the children, and then put forth some like awful policy for the children. Moral panics have been with us since, honestly, the time of Socrates. Who incited a, a moral panic? People were just scared. He was corrupting the youth, impiety. That's, that's all moral panic stuff. We can't deal with this, so we have to kill him. And... Um, 
that's that's where we are and i think we can do better we can be less susceptible we need to immunize ourselves to moral panics to immunize ourselves to moral panics and you do that by upholding democracy not by telling people things won't change but that things will change in a way that actually makes us a more robust nation. Because one, once again, moral panics will take root when people don't know how whatever institution they're trying to conserve or, or assemblage of institutions they're trying to conserve hangs together. If they don't know how it hangs together, then any sort of change seems like it could threaten the whole thing. But if they know how it changes together and why it, change, it holds together and why it's good that it holds together and why, how it could be changed appropriately, then they'll be less panicky about you know, initiatives for the appropriate change. All right. Thank you for your time. I'll see you next week.